it, there is still a lot of oxytocin around the blood. There's still a lot of uh, oxytocin in circulation. But you can walk around without labor during her pregnancy. She doesn't have to go into labor. She doesn't have to go into myometrial contractions at ordinary times. And yet there is oxytocin that can act on myometrium to cause contraction. But suddenly at the time of uh, delivery, at the time when labor is due, some and on the myometrial receptors, and suddenly they become 100 times more sensitive to oxytocin than they were before. And the little oxytocin that is in circulation causes them to contract. As we shall see when we come to that, it is that progesterone is there all the time blocking these oxytocin receptors. And immediately progesterone goes down at the end of pregnancy because placenta has aged, then you find there's progesterone withdrawal in myometrium and the receptors of oxytocin suddenly, even the receptors of prolactin suddenly uh, upgrade. Their sensitivity goes up by a hundred times and suddenly the myometrium can contract without necessarily levels of oxytocin going up. I'm sure we have looked at this when you look at cardiovascular system and you find a lot of times in hypertension on high blood pressure, there is increased sensitivity to catecholamides. There's increased uh, sensitivity by the small arterioles to adrenaline so that uh, the adrenaline that is in circulation gives a lot of contraction of these small smooth muscles of the small vessels and they cause high arterial pressure and therefore high blood pressure. And many times to treat this, all we need is to use some beta or alpha blockers. We use uh, adrenergic blockers or uh, blockers that are going to block adrenaline and noradrenaline at the smooth muscle level in the small uh, blood vessels, and that reduces the blood pressure. So the story of receptors is the most important story across chemical messengers, across the hormones. Even when we come to talk about diuresis or loss of water in the convolute, in the convoluted tubules and collecting ducts in the kidneys, we find that just by increasing the number of aquaporin receptors, the receptors in these uh, last parts of the tubular system, you get increased, you get increased water reabsorption so that you don't make as much urine as you were making before. And that is why we call this antidiuresis. That is what uh, ADH or antidiuretic hormone does. Because it's reabsorption of water simply by increasing um, what we call the aquaporin receptors or aquaporin tools in these parts of the renal tubules. And we have many, many other examples we are going to be discussing about receptor sensitivity, about receptor inhibition and receptor blockage or inhibition as we move along. And that is how a lot of regulation of hormonal activity is done. However, we need to think about the whole of the endocrine system as a system of regulating activities in the body regulating responses in the body as a reaction to deficiencies or excesses, as a reaction to change. Whenever there is change in some parameter, be it temperature, be it uh, levels of glucose, be it uh, contraction uh, status of a smooth muscle, all these things, when they are changing, they need regulation. They need a way of detecting how much is the change and therefore dictating 
how much is going to be the, the ability to correct. And that is what the endocrine system is all about. And as I told you, it works with the, with the neuro regulation so that at times we need neuroendocrine regulation. We need to use both mechanisms of neuro or action potentials and mechanisms of chemical messengers to regulate a function like temperature or like glucose levels. I will go here, we are getting on. So I'll tell you this problem. And that is why today we want to concentrate much on the role of hypothalamus and anterior pituitary in regulation of most of the endocrine functions, because there are times we need to coordinate the two systems. And that is why we are going to look at hypothalamus, even if it is a neural tissue, even if it's an organ of nuclei, of neuro nuclei, it also has, it is also a gland. It secretes hormones. It creates, it secretes um, regulating hormones onto the anterior pituitary and therefore regulates the lower glands like thyroid, adrenal uh, glands and the, and the gonads. And it also um, regulates other tissues like liver, skin and muscle activity. Hello, thank you, Wango. We had a little problem with the sharing of slides. In case we go along. Yeah, we are going on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Let's let's stay there on the hypothalamus. Yeah. So when we look at the hypothalamus. It's interesting in that it is uh, both a neuro tissue, it is actually part of brain. It is part of the um, higher brain. In fact, it is part of the diencephalon, as you remember where it is towards the frontal part of the diencephalon. And therefore, it has these nuclei that receive afferents from uh, and the cranial nerves, it receives. Uh, afferents from sensory organs like the ear, the eyes, the nose, and even other organs. It receives input from baroreceptors, osmoreceptors, and chemoreceptors. It is part of brain. But at the same time, parts of the hypothalamus secrete substances, secrete chemicals that are endocrine, that are hormones. So when we look at acute area of the hypothalamus, when we look at uh, the, the, the medial eminence, we find they produce releasing hormones and inhibitory hormones to the anterior pituitary. When we look at the paraventricular nuclei, the paraventricular uh, areas, and uh, paraoptic or preoptic areas of the hypothalamus, we find this produce chemical substances. They are endocrine. They produce endocrine factors, which are um, the decapeptides that are released into the posterior pituitary and then they are released on as hormones. That is antidiuretic hormone, ovasopressin, and oxytocin. They are released from these nuclei, from paraventricular and uh, paraoptic or preoptic uh, nuclei or tissues. And indeed, a long time ago, we did not know there were two different hormones, oxytocin and vasopressin. 
uh, it was all called pit press or the pituitary extract. And these nanopeptides were later separated so that we now know that vasopressin, which was called vasopressin because it is a very strong vasoconstrictor in the small arteries. Using receptors that are the A receptors, we find that it is a vasoconstrictor in the small arteries and can cause quite a high blood pressure and uh, with overproduction can also increase blood pressure. And then we find oxytocin is separate from vasopressin. It may look about the same, but ADH or, um, sorry, um, ADH or vasopressin will act on vasopressin receptors where oxytocin will act on oxytocin receptors. And then later it was actually found that vasopressin most action, the most direct or focused action is actually on the renal tubules, the eh? uh, distal convoluted tubules and collecting that where it increases aquaporin 2, it increases these receptors in, the, uh, in those large cells of the collecting ducts, and therefore increases water reabsorption. And that is why it was called antidiuretic hormone because it is antidiuresis. It reduces uresis, it reduces urine output. So that is ADH and those uh, the receptors now in the kidney were referred to as V2s, whereas the ones in the blood vessels were V1s or VAs, these are V2s or VB, VB2. And those are the ones that uh, increase aquaporins and affect the, the what was reduced water loss for conservation of water. So that we actually find that the production or release of hormones from hypothalamus can actually be responding to neuro inputs like vagal inputs that go back to the hypothalamus, to the areas uh, that are related, say, like to the stomach, the stretch or volume of stomach, and they go to the hunger center or feeding center, like we saw last time. The hypothalamus has cells that detect blood glucose, that is in the ventromedial nucleus. These are like glucose starts, just like glucose starts in the liver. They detect glucose. And this input also goes to the hunger center or feeding center and increases feeding. And then we find that hypothalamus also receives uh, inputs from even the visual and uh, auditory and uh, the nasal um, inputs or the ones that are related to, uh, to smell and all that so that like when they go to the vomiting center, as we shall see hypothalamus in the control of visceral function, they go to the vomiting center and they cause vomiting. And as you can see, these were, were inputs from neuro. These are neuro inputs. They may be vagus, they may be auditory nerve, they may be olfactory nerve, they may be through the glossopharyngeal nerve, but they will give, they will stimulate the, the hunger, the, the vomiting center, which is in a position called the CTZ or chemo trigger zone. So that through this, uh, through this zone, chemicals are detected and they give their own stimulation that now allows the vomiting center to send down efferent activity, efferents to the uh, glottis and the glossopharyngeal areas, so that the process of vomiting will start sometimes as 
neuro or even as chemical, and then it will end up being more neuro in that it will be action of, uh, or it will be a negative reflex on the swallowing reflex. It will be a negative effect on swallowing reflex, and that is now neuro. So hypothalamus gives a representation of both neuro and chemical, and it can regulate both. It can coordinate uh, both neuro and chemical. That's why we want to think about hypothalamus not just as part of brain, not just as a neuro uh, organ, but also as a gland, the highest endocrine gland, it also regulates the, the glands below it. Now, as you know, we have what is called a blood brain barrier, so that chemicals do not easily get into the brain. Toxins that are circulating in blood do not easily go into brain. That is urea toxins that are probably foreign in the, in the circulation uh, should not enter the brain because they are going to cause uh, havoc to activities of the physiology. That is why there's a, a blood-brain barrier. But we find some chemicals need to pass through the brain to give a signal, to give a message that, yes, the levels of toxins are going up to something. For example, if urea is high, it needs to be detected in the, in the hypothalamus so that we can start a process of, of uh, diuresis, of increasing. Uh, loss of urea through urine and also breakdown of urea to products or breakdown of ammonia to products that are less toxic. Because what will be circulating is ammonia after protein degradation. And ammonia is, uh, is toxic. But once it goes through these areas we are talking about that allow entry of substances into brain, they will, it is ammonia that will be top. This ammonia needs to be changed into urea, uric acid, and other substances that are able to be dissolved in water, excreted, and they are less top. Now, for that matter, that we need substances that are circulating in blood, to be able to pass through some barrier in this BBP to be detected inside hypothalamus, like in uh, CTZ or chemotriga zone, we have what are called the circumventricular organ, circumventricular organs. That means some windows, through the walls of the ventricles. Windows which allow entry of chemicals from circulation into brain through the BBP and they allow that type of entry. And they are usually found there near the third, at the walls of the third ventricle at uh, zona protrema or area protrema and others. And these are the circumventricular organs. As those of you who know French, ventricular means window. And that is the important thing about uh, detection in the hypothalamus. That is why we are going to talk about hypothalamus as a very important regulating gland. On one hand, we have found it receives neural inputs and it can also give neural outputs, especially through the sympathetic system. It will cause activity on blood vessels, it will cause activity on the skin, it will cause activity on the liver function, and many of these are actually through its neural output. We also find it will be there in reflexes of visceral functions, that is uh, organs that are usually hollow organs or smooth muscle organs, 
like the stomach, the intestines, the esophagus, uh, the lungs, the heart, effects from hypothalamus will go down uh, through nerves to these areas. At the same time, they will be affected by secretions of the sympathetic ganglia and sympathetic system, the neurotransmitters, the catecholamines, so that the hypothalamus will control these functions down uh, using um, nerve, using nerves and also using uh, sympathetic out. This is especially important when we see reactions to baroreceptors and reaction to um, uh, to chemoreceptors. That is why we want to think about hypothalamus as part of brain. But at the same time, we have said hypothalamus also regulates functions through anterior pituitary through hormone release. There are two types of hormones that are released from hypothalamus directly onto the anterior pituitary and regulate the different cells of anterior pituitary that we saw yesterday. The three that you would want to talk about, or the four that you would want to talk about more as releasing hormones or release hormones are the thyroid release hormone and gonadotropin release hormone that I told you that when they flow from hypothalamus to anterior pituitary, they act on thyrotropes and gonadotropes. They act on cells that stain basophilic, on cells that synthesize glycosylated pepper. That is uh, TSH and uh, gonadotropins. That is FSH and LA. And these are both stimulatory, that is TRH and PNRH. Then the other group of release hormones are the release hormones for growth hormone. Although that one we cannot emphasize very much because growth hormone is not known for action of growth hormone release hormone, uh, which was only described much later and it is not such an important uh, hormone. What is important in growth is inhibiting hormone that is released by hypothalamus to inhibit somato somatotrophs, to inhibit anterior pituitary cells that produce growth hormone. So most of the time we talk about somatostatin which is from hypothalamus. Otherwise, there is also a little bit of a growth hormone, release hormone. We would probably still refer to it as growth hormone release factor. Because all these growth hormone release hormones, or rather all these uh, hypothalamic growth hormone, uh, hypothalamic release hormones were called hypothalamic release factors before they were actually identified. They were known to be there, but had not been identified. They have been identified and synthesized, and we know the size, we know the sequence of amino acids, so we call them hormones. So whereas in the old literature, you'll be reading about some gonadotropin-releasing factors, now they are called gonadotropin-releasing hormones, and they even have names, although most of the gonadotropin-releasing hormone is the FSH release hormone. But it really works like the same with LH release hormone. And then we have got for growth and for prolactin, these are hormones that do not have to stimulate prolactin production every day, and they do not have to uh, stimulate growth every day, because we only need growth when we are in utero and early in uh, infancy, and also around the time of uh, puberty. The rest of the time, growth hormone is not very spectacularly secreted, and growth hormone at this time is usually an agonist of 
uh, of insulin. We find that it mainly acts like insulin. It is anabolic. It causes uh, buildup of small units like glucose into glycogen for storage, amino acids into peptides or into proteins for growth, and free fatty acids into fatty acid uh, chains. So that is the role of growth hormone in life, which is the same activity as insulin. So actually, we say growth hormone has insulin-like activity or insula. I-N-S-L-A in capital, insulin-like activity. And this activity is carried out not necessarily by the whole hormone structure, but by some sections of its amino acid chain that are recognized by receptors. So that when you look at the whole of the growth hormone, is a folded but continuous long chain polypeptide of about 192 amino acids. It has many sections, some of which are 39 amino acids, some 45 amino acids. There's the beginning, there's the middle, there is the intermediate, there's the final. And this, <coughs> these segments can act and can be detected by receptors as species of growth hormone. And so we call them somatomedins or growth factors. Somato means body cells or growth. Medins means mediators. That means they are positive effect as opposed to statin. Statin means static effect or inhibitory effect. So somatomedins are analogs and pieces of growth hormone through which growth hormone acts for growth purposes or conservation of organic uh, structure in the body or for storage structures in the body. So that is, it is positive growth, it is a positive uh, protein balance, it is positive nitrogen balance, and that is like insulin, that's growth hormone. So we find for growth hormone, what the hypothalamus produces mainly is a growth hormone inhibitor, which is called somatostatin. So rather than growth hormone release hormone, it produces somatostatin. The other inhibitor hypothalamus produces is prolactin inhibitor. Because like we said, we do not have to be producing milk all the time. And prolactin is mainly for milk ejection, milk production. Although it is also important when we come to sperm transport, sperm maturation and sperm transport. But here we are talking about very low levels of pro prolactin, not like in milk ejection. And since we do not need milk a lot of time in life, what hypothalamus produces is an inhibitor of prolactin. That is PIH, prolactin inhibiting hormone. Like I told you, some of these very high hormones, especially inhibitors, are simple amines. So PIH is a simple amine. PIH is dopamine. So hypothalamus produces dopamine to inhibit prolactin. Although in theory, there is a prolactin releasing hormone and most likely when it is synthesized because it is being synthesized now it will be it will look almost like a dropping release hormone or, gonna, or, or uh, like uh, growth hormone release hormone and it will be something like that the one amino acid long it will be a medium sized peptide or protein so those are the hormones that are produced by hypothalamus to specifically regulate the three axes. We are going to talk about the three axes that are regulated from hypothalamus to anterior pituitary to the glands below, plus the prolactin that we have talked about. Now, it is also useful to note 
their sizes, just like I started yesterday, that for all these hormones, it would help you if you can know their chemical structure, their receptor activity, and therefore their relationship with other hormones that they can interact because they may be of similar structure. And hypothalamus, you don't have many hormones, you have something like seven hormones to learn. And so they are very easy. And I'd like you to look at them in terms of structure and start with the smallest. What I've told you is that prolactin inhibiting factor is dopamine. And we'll find dopamine as a neurotransmitter in the sympathetic system. Dopamine is uh, one of the catecholamines in the sympathetic system, so that the nerves there have got dopamine receptors D1 up to D4. Dopamine receptors. And here in the hypothalamus, in the brain, dopamine is a very important inhibitor. Uh, you can call it a PIH, prolactin inhibiting hormone, but it's purely dopamine. It's the only hypothalamic hormone that is one simple amine. But remember, the other inhibitor that is produced by a gland higher than hypothalamus and inhibits hypothalamus is from the pineal body. It is um, the, 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 the pineal body itself produces an amine that inhibits hypothalamus, especially in as far as release of growth hormone and release of gonadotropin are concerned. And I actually told you the name of the hormone from the uh, from from the pineal body called melatonin. Melatonin is a simple amine, just like we have said, PIH is a single amine. And you find because it is an inhibitor, an inhibitor of growth, people have commercially tried to use it as an anti-growth hormone that because the clock of aging is in hypothalamus. Clock of aging, or what tells you you are aging, or what tells the body is aging, sits in the hypothalamus and mainly part of being your body, and mainly uh, brought down. I mean, um, controlled by um, by that, that that hormone that you have said that uh, that amino acid that we have said. And so you find some people sell it. It is actually prepared and sold as a useful supplement or useful hormone that can delay your aging. So that for those people who get gray hair very early or they get wrinkles very early or they start looking old much earlier than they should or start losing all their dental formula early, that sometimes they are told to take this uh, uh, this uh, hormone from the pineal uh, from the pineal gland, and they are told it will help them to slow down growth. But the truth is, I told you when we are talking about endocrine activity, we are talking about receptors, and even if you take it. Even if you take it at your age or my age, it will not act because you do not have the receptors now. You had the receptors during puberty, you had the receptors in uh, infancy, but now you don't have those receptors. So it will not have much effect. So those are inhibitors, simple, Amino acids, like I told you before, and I'll continue talking like that for a long time. I'll talk about dopamine, I'll talk about um, even the catecholamines in the brain, in the higher center, and in the 
intestinal mucosa. We'll talk about the GABA. We'll talk about um, uh, all these other inhibitors, inhibiting hormones that are in the CNS. And we find all of them are, they are amino acids. And then after that, we now come to the next inhibitor that was somatostatin. Somatostatin is also not long. It is only 10 amino acids long. So it is uh, quite short, just like gonadotropin releasing hormone. And then we have got uh, TRH, which is for thyroxine. And this is not an inhibitor. These are releasing hormones, it's an activator and it is three amino acids. So in sizes, we can go from dopamine to TRH to GNRH. GNRH is 10 amino acids, it is a deca. Right? This one would compare very well with the hormones of the posterior pituitary, with oxytocin and uh, ADH, which are deca peptides, which are nanopeptides, they are nine. Gonadotropin release hormone is 10. Is 10, is decapeptide. And so all these ones that I've told you up to that 10, they are synthesized. They are now available as hormones. They can be used for replacement. They can be used for many purposes that even sometimes in contraception or in family planning, you may actually find synthetic uh, gonadotropins used as a pump on the arm so that they can keep gonadotropin releasing hormone high and that high gonadotropin release hormone in the circulation uh, suppresses natural gonadotropin release hormone and therefore suppresses estrogen production and changes the pattern of ovulation. So that is why it is important to know the structures of hypothalamic hormones, and to know which ones are already in use, which ones are already uh, prepared and can be used for treatment, even for replacement therapy. Because, for example, you find that uh, sometimes you have prolactin, very high prolactin, like in prolactinomas. And high prolactin will give you the high prolactin will suppress uh, FSH and will interfere with fertility, will interfere with milk production, so that you may even get galactoria where somebody is producing milk at the wrong time. Sometimes you find even a man is producing milk, and sometimes this can even be caused by drugs, like some antihypertensive drugs that would have some effect that would reduce the effect of dopamine and therefore you find that um, prolactin goes up. So for prolactin, we also sometimes use uh, substances that can change to dopamine, usually methyl dopa or other um, pseudo dopas that can be used, that can be converted to be anti-prolactin to prolactin. Normally, dopamine does not enter, go through the blood, blood, blood brain barrier. That is why normally we use L-dopa, so that when L-dopa crosses the brain barrier, it is then converted to dopamine. Otherwise, it will not be able to cross. So you find why we use L-dopa even in uh, treating hypertension to try to inhibit or to suppress effects of dopamine or sometimes the effects of other things. So those are the structures of uh, PRH, PIH, and uh, gonadotropins. They are all short, amino acids or single amino acids. Now we come to the other two. The corticotropin release hormone, or CRH, which acts on corticotropin in the anterior pituitary, and also the 
growth hormone, release hormone, which I told you is not very spectacular. So in this area, we are mainly going to think about the corticotropin release hormone. This one is medium size amino acids, about 45, uh, medium chain, uh, medium size peptide is about 45 amino acids long, CRH. And therefore, uh, growth hormone release hormone, uh, prolactin release hormone, they will all be in this, in this group of medium chain uh, amino acids. A medium chain, medium size, which are much like the hormones of the parathyroid, which are much like parathyroid hormone. If you look at their size, they are also much like um, the endocrine pancreas, the, 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 pan, the pancreat, pancreatic peptides. Uh, although they are not like somatostatin because the pancreatic somatostatin is exactly like the hypothalamic somatostatin that is anti-growth hormone, anti-insulin. So basically that is hypo how hypothalamus regulates actions or activities of anterior pituitary. And what I wanted you to really look at is that you have two groups, short peptides, or single amines that are inhibitory. And there are also neurotransmitters in brain. There are neurotransmitters in um, GIT, that is in the enteric brain, and there are somatostatin and uh, prolactin inhibiting hormone or dopamine. And then I give you now the other group, the TRH and the thyroid release hormone and the gonadotropins, which are three amino acids and 10 amino acids. And the 10 amino acid is very much like the hormones of bacteria pituitary, which are uh, nanopeptides. And we'll come to them soon. So we can basically say that is how hypothalamus regulates the hormones of anterior pituitary through actual secretions, through actual endocrine secretions from the acute area and from um, and from the mammillary area of the hypothalamus. Then we shall come to posterior pituitary. Posterior pituitary receives its hormones from paraventricular nucleus or paraventricular area, that is uh, the walls of third ventricle and preoptic and paraoptic uh, nuclei or the area around the optic asthma. You go and check what optic asthma is, is where the optic nerves cross because you remember they cross from right to left or they cross from one side to the other and they make a junction, a chiasma. Mm -hmm. So these are where these nuclei of the hypothalamus are and these nuclei in what are called the magnocellular tissues or magnocellular organs, which are large cells. These cells are the ones that produce posterior pituitary hormones. So let's look at posterior pituitary hormones. And I've told you they are very, very much like the hypothalamic hormones. They are like the TRH and the gonadotropins. They are decapeptides. They are, they are nanopeptides. And you may even need to know a little bit about their structure. Because sometimes we do use them. They are synthesized. And we do use them in replacement, like in uh, diabetes insipidus. We can give somebody uh, vasopressin, which is either synthetic vasopressin, or we can even give fish vasopressin. And it will be a little bit different from human vasopressin. But the difference is only one amino acid, the position of one amino acid. We'll see why you, would, you should not give a human X probably safer to use a fish um, extract of 
are suppressed and our antidiuretic hormone. And this is why we need to know about their structures and how they act on receptors. So I think we go straight to posterior pituitary hormones, and these posterior pituitary hormones are produced, synthesized in the hypothalamus, but their secretion is regulated in posterior pituitary or they are secreted from posterior. So let's go down a little to, to the number two. As you can see there, I've given you a summary of the four mechanisms of how hypothalamus controls the lower glands. And then we have added and tissues because hypothalamus also controls some muscle activity, like in smooth muscles, like say in the heart, in the intestines, and also in skeletal muscles, uh, like the ATP utilization and contraction in skeletal muscles. We find that the hypothalamus also controls liver cells directly in the use of the use of glucose and changes of glucose, hypothalamus has direct control on the liver. Again, as a temperature response in thermal regulation, we said hypothalamus actually does have control directly on liver cells and it has control on skin uh, function. So that is why we say hypothalamus does not just control lower glands, that is uh, thyroid, adrenal, uh, cortex and uh, gonads, it also controls some tissues. And especially when we come to talk about viscera, when we talk about uh, um, smooth muscle tissues, hollow tissues, hollow organs of the body, that is visceral function in the body, we find hypothalamus gives control. So there are four different mechanisms that the hypothalamus uses control thing, the tissues below. And we have already discussed number one is through direct release of inhibiting hormones and release hormones to adenohypophysis, area hypophysis. Adeno means glandular hypophysis. This is glands, they produce hormones. So this is the most important um, regulation or control through anterior pituitary, we've already discussed that. We've talked about the seven release hormones, the five release hormones and two inhibitory hormones it releases onto anterior pituitary. Then number two is onto posterior pituitary and here it secretes neuropeptides, vasopressin or ADH and oxytocin. And these are secreted directly into posterior pituitary, and then they are after released and controlled from posterior pituitary. But they are synthesized in the magnocellular units in the hypothalamus. And then the third way hypothalamus controls the lower organs is through the sympathetic system as the master ganglion of the sympathetic Especially when we talk about cardiovascular control, cardiovascular uh, uh, cardiovascular control of both the heart rate and the contractility, through the sympathetic system, the respiratory control through the bronchial system, the intestinal system of both um, muscle, smooth muscle movement, motility, and also in terms of enzyme secretion or quality of secretions, we have direct control by hypothalamus. And therefore, we also have detection by hypothalamus of the state of these systems, cardiovascular, respiratory, um, intestinal, and even thermal regulation. We have afferent inputs, especially through the cranial nerves and through the sympathetic. Them. We have afferent reception, so we have the reception areas in hypothalamus, 
coordinating centers in hypothalamus for all these. We'll be talking about them at different times when we talk about regulation. For example, you have baroreceptor, you have osmoreceptor, you have uh, chemoreceptor uh, centers where these messages are received and therefore hypothalamus sends efferents down. These efferents can be neuro efferents and they can also be chemical efferents like we said. For example, the thermoregulation center and receive direct neuro communication about temperature on the skin, that will be neuro. It will also receive uh, other chemical um, information as temperature goes up, so metabolic. And then the hypothalamus will respond through sympathetic Did system. I... Yes, sympathetic system and change the skin status for both conservation of water and temperature and for the loss. And at the same time, it will have effect on the liver and muscles to utilize more glucose and fats to produce, I mean, to break down ATP energy into heat and you get the heat in the body. That is how hypothalamus works. It has both neuro and chemical, and these are the four different ways of regulation. It also has neural connection with the neighboring areas of brain, like the limb stem from up. That means it is affected by the cortical areas of the brain by experience, by reasoning. So when we come to talk about things like natural behavior or um, autonomic behavior, there are many times it is actually modified by memory and reasoning or rationalization. This is through the Olympics. That is why even if you are hungry, there is a hunger input output as you pass through a glass shop with a lot of nice cakes you do not break glass and eat the cakes you hold on because there are many factors you need to know whether it is open whether you can buy whether you can afford and whether you need it the same thing, even an animal, when a male animal sees a female animal and it would naturally have a reflex that is sexual, it will also hold on to know whether this is the right place, the right time, and what is the normal approach. And here by animal, I'm including the human animal. So that the hypothalamus brings in higher brain brings in cortical inputs through the limbic system. Again, hypothalamus is connected to brainstem and pons. And through this, it also modifies things like temperature, modifies heart rate, and modifies things like in osmo regulation, the absorption of sodium, potassium, and water. Not to mention that regulation of sodium is also done by atrionatriotic hormone, but that is simply between the atrial muscle and the, and the, uh, the, in production and reabsorption in the renal tubules. So that hypothalamus has direct communication upwards to the thalamus and the cortex and downwards to the brainstem and the pons. And the pons and brainstem 
communication is very, very important in cardiovascular and respiratory control, and also in temperature control. As you remember, if there is damage in pons, like pontine hemorrhage and death, temperature will continue to go up even after because of the pons effect on the hypothalamus and temperature. So we can go down to where we have got the posterior pituitary sections. Posterior pituitary, which is now the number two. Number one, we have already talked about anterior pituitary through anterior pituitary. Number two is uh, control through uh, posterior pituitary, that is neuropeptide, vasopeptides, uh, vasopressin, and oxytocin, which we said uh, uh nanopeptides so let's go to slides that are showing posterior between Yeah. Lower, lower, and yeah, posterior pituitary hormones. Just where you are. Yes, we have said there are two posterior pituitary hormones, the ADH or antidiuretic hormone. And there is uh, oxytocin, which are produced in the same cells, magnocellular units of the <coughs> paraventricular nuclei and preoptic and paraoptic uh, um, nuclei which are around the optic asthma. Optic asthma is used because it is very easy to, uh, to identify either on scans, especially these days when the scans are very well uh, um, and, uh, shown or they can very well be identified with a good magnifying or magnetic uh, resonance. And in the scans, you can actually see the chiasma, optic chiasma. And so around it, you can see the nuclei, paraoptic nuclei and preoptic. Paraventricular uh, areas are also well seen because they are the windows of the third ventricle. And this is where these substances are produced. And <clears throat> they seem to be produced in the same system where you produce, where they are produced as nano. And as I told you a long time ago, they were, we did not separate them. We did not separate uh, vasopressin from oxytocin. We took them as one and we called them pitrecin. You can see pitrecin really means um, a vasopressin from the, from the pituitary. pituitary. But now they, with time, they came on to be identified, separated properly, and made quite, quite uh, distinct. So that there's ADH, which was called vasopressin because it is a vasoconstrictor in the small vessels. In fact, they used to say it was the strongest vasoconstrictor materials. And that those receptors were called the V1 or the VA. And it is only much later that its effect on antidiuresis in the distal convoluted tubule and collecting that is the most specific activity of vasopressin. So it was called antidiuretic hormone or ADH. <coughs> like I told you, ADH is one hormone that has been synthesized over a long time and is used for replacement. It is synthesized 
and is used to replace where we have deficiency of ADH. Deficiency of ADH means you cannot conserve water. You cannot stop diuresis. You cannot stop passing too much urine. And therefore, you get a condition that is called diuresis. You get a condition that is called diabetes. Just like we get diabetes because of high glucose, you pass a lot of urine. This one is high, the glucose is normal, you pass a lot of urine, but this you cannot see the cause. You could not see why you are passing too much urine. So it was called uh, diabetes insipidus. Insipidus means hidden or uh, not obvious. So diabetes insipidus is too much loss of urine because of low ADH, because of ADH inadequacy, ADH insufficiency from posterior pituitary, from uh, the posterior pituitary. Not enough resuppression. And that is what is called diabetes. So what was the treatment? What is the treatment of diabetes insipidus? is purely you give somebody ADH injections. You give them ADH, you give them antidiuretic hormone, and therefore it has been necessary to synthesize ADH. Before that, we used to first of all use the human extract of ADH, I told you it was called vitrecine, but as you will learn, we don't like injecting human extract into somebody, because there will be many other proteins that come with it and they will be recognized by the body and the body will make antibodies against them. So anti-immune reactions against human extracts are very common and very dangerous. So that is why many times we use extract. Normally, genetically, the ones that are close will be extracts of fish, or extracts of pork, or sign, or fish um, extracts. And that's why we find even when you discuss about insulin replacement, we have gone through that. We have gone through uh, porcine insulin. We have gone about bovine insulin, which is from cows. And we have gone through fish insulin. So, that is why you need to know that when we talk about the human ADH, it's very, very close to other ADH. It's very close to fish ADH. But human ADH is called arginine vasopressin. It is vasopressin because it's a vasoconstrictor, small vessels. So arginine vasopressin is the ideal chemical to replace what you should give. But since this will be human, unless you make it, when you now synthesize, you can give arginine vasopressin, and that will be human vasopressin. However, when you gave fish vasopressin, it didn't have arginine, it had leucine. It, has, it is called leucine vasopressin. Arginine is man, that is in position seven of the decapeptide. You find that position seven in man is always arginine. Amino acid is arginine. In fish, it is lysine. It works as well. The only thing is probably the uh, lysine one will take longer. So you don't lose it as quickly as if you gave human. And you'll be finding that in a lot of replacement in chemicals, replacements of hormones, that in many cases, you don't want to give exactly the human structure because the half, the half life is very short. It will be metabolized very quickly because the body has the enzymes. But when you give a structure that is altered a little, it gives you longer half-life, it stays longer. And that is one reason we'll talk about, like I told you earlier, instead of using DOPA or dopamine, we use L-DOPA and L-DOPA will have a little bit of longer 
longer half life. Will not be broken down as quick. Just like when you talk about cortisol, if you give somebody human cortisol, you find the half life is very short. It's like five to seven minutes. So you give dexamethasone or you give some other artificial uh, cortisol and you find it lasts a lot longer. And that is the history of insulin. When you read about insulin synthesis for the last 100 years, because insulin is one of the hormones that has been replaced and synthesized for a very long time, we are going to be talking about short time. In fact, now we talk about rapid, rapid insulin, short time insulin, long, medium size, ins, medium time insulin. Um, insulin. So there are insulin that can last 24 hours in the body. There are some that can last 12 hours. There are some that can last half an hour. And the normal half-life of insulin, the human insulin, is about half an hour or 20 minutes. So by making synthetic, every time you try to get something that is not metabolized so quickly, something that is held in the body for some time. And that means you don't have to keep injecting somebody every 15 to 20 minutes, but you inject somebody every six hours. Then that is, that is more convenient. And that is the important thing about these structures. And that is the differences that are made during manufacture of the different hormones. The same thing with oxytocin, we try very much to use because oxytocin is synthesized now, we have a lot of it. We use oxytocin during delivery when you want to accelerate or to control the rate of contractions and delivery, you find there's a lot of oxytocin even when you go to health centers in the village where delivery may be occurring, you have oxytocin which is uh, usually referred to as syntocinon. But this is the same oxytocinon, which is a peptide. Again, you try to put different preparations because of its half-life. However, we still maintain the same half-life of about 10 minutes of oxytocin. And normally, you don't have a lot of changes, not like suppressing. So, the important thing about the similarity of these two is that oxytocin also has effect on vessel, on uh, vessel contractility. So it also causes a bit of uh, vessel constriction in small vessels. So it can give you high blood pressure. So when you are inducing somebody in labor with oxytocin, somebody who already has high blood pressure, you have to be careful about your doses and your rates because it will give you high blood pressure. It will also, of course, conserve water. So it will cause more water to be reabsorbed. And when you add the two together, that you absorb more water, you reabsorb more water. So blood volume goes up. And again, you increase the vessel capillary uh, um, pressure or constriction, then you are adding to high blood pressure. And high blood pressure in pregnancy is quite a special uh, condition, it's a possibility. So those are the hormones from the posterior pituitary hormone, the antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin, and the oxytocin. As I told you, antidiuretic hormone or ADH acts through aquaporin-2 receptors in the chief cells of the distal tubule and collecting ducts. Remember, it comes from magnocellular cells in the hypothalamus and it acts on chief cells or principal cells in the distal tubules and collecting ducts. That is how it conserves water. It's also important to realize that this is more important at night. So a lot of it is produced at night after midnight so that you don't keep passing urine into the bladder at night when you are asleep. 
because you are going to cause bladder discomfort. So you don't produce much urine at night because of the high production of ADH. And therefore, when you have problems with the ADH, like what we talked about, deficiency, which gives you diabetes in CPDAS, this is more notable at night. Wake up at night, pass urine. What is most important about this urine, it is also very dilute. You know, it doesn't have enough sodium. It doesn't have enough of the other substances because it is happening in the very last section when you have already reabsorbed all the ions and you are left with just water. So diabetes insipidus is a lot of urine that is dilute. And of course, when you taste it, it is not as sweet as diabetes mellitus. Mellitus means sweet. That means for somebody who has diabetes mellitus, their urine is a lot, but it is sweet. And many times or other, you can test sugar in it. And you can also test sugar in it. It can have some uh, urine, glycosuria, some uh, glucose in urine. The one of insipidus will not. In fact, it will be urine of low, um, of low osmolality, or what we'd say it has a low tension. So, for example, it will be uh, when we measure its concentration, it will be less than 1010. It will be less than the concentration of plasma. So, that is diabetes in CPDAS. Now, you must be asking about the opposite of diabetes in CPDAS. Sometimes what we may have, we can go down a bit more. You can give us the next slide. Sometimes what we may have, instead of deficiency of ADH, we may have too much ADH. That is inappropriate secretion of ADH, inappropriate production of ADH. And now that will mean too much reabsorption of water. And of course, you know, that gives uh, a poor balance in osmotic pressure. And it alters the concentration of electrolytes in plasma. So it is not good when you have too much ADH, and therefore you have inappropriate. So that one, we, that, that condition where we have uh, too much ADH, or too much vasopressin, and therefore we have too much water reabsorption. It is called inappropriate ADH production or IADH. IADH, inappropriate production antidiuretic hormone. And that is also a pathophysiology, a pathological condition where you may have to, have to do replacement of ADH, just like we talked about, uh, replacement of uh, oxytocin or other substances. So we've already talked about oxytocin. And a lot of times commercially it's referred to as syntocin on the oxytocin that has been synthesized. And we have already said it is a decap, a, a straight chain, rather it is a double chain of uh, nine amino acids. Its amino acids will be the same synthetically as the one in man. And like the pressing, I told you, you must realize position seven in the natural status is arginine. We call it arginine visopressin because you may have to describe the different uh, visopressins. In oxytocin, you don't have to. The natural one is very much like uh, the one that is synthesized. So, what are the functions of oxytocin? The major function of oxytocin is uterine contraction during labor. 
it increases uterine contraction, it increases myometrial activity, and therefore what is most important is its receptors on the myometrium, that is on the muscle layer of the uterus. And this is one good example of what you call a positive feedback mechanism. The more you contract and the more you squeeze the myometrium, the more oxytocin is produced so that it continues to increase more and more and more during labor. That is why when somebody is starting labor in a labor world, you hear them just breathing loudly and complaining a bit about pain. Lakini muda si muda. If you wait for another 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes, what happens? Their cry increases. It even goes to screams. And in four or five hours, it goes to a crusado. Before they actually push the baby, the contraction is nearly five. 500 times what it was at the beginning. All this is because of increased oxytocin receptor sensitivity. So throughout labor, throughout 24 hours around the time of labor, what increases is not amount of oxytocin produced, oxytocin produced. It is the amount, it is the sensitivity of the receptors. And what causes this increase in sensitivity of receptors? It is easier to ask the other question. What blocks these receptors of oxytocin during pregnancy so that somebody doesn't go into labor? It is progesterone that suppresses them. And as we shall see, one of the most important uh, actions of progesterone is inhibiting oxytocin receptors in the myometrium. And at term, progesterone levels go down, placenta <coughs> grows old, it doesn't have proper circulation, <coughs> it doesn't produce enough progesterone. So progesterone, which has been inhibiting myometrial receptors, is withdrawn, is not there. So we call it progesterone withdrawal. And that leads to oxytocin receptors increasing their sensitivity a hundredfold. And now contractions can happen with the little prostaglandins are there and the oxytocin that is there, uh, their effects on the myometry. The same story happens with prolactin. There's prolactin all this time in pregnancy, but and we shall see the, the rate of increase of lactin is very high just before labor. And yet the woman does not produce milk. But immediately, the baby and placenta are expelled, <coughs> able to produce milk because the prolactin's receptor sensitivity goes up in the breasts. So, Please give me a minute, I take some water, and then I come back. Oh, 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 oh. It's not easy. So that we find there is a lot of similarity between what happens to exhaust oxytocin at term and at birth, and what happens to prolactin at term and at birth. And the two, oxytocin and prolactin, move on, on to milk production and milk ejection. And that is another activity of oxytocin, ejection of milk by contraction of myopithelial cells around the ducts, the milk ducts. Now, you will ask whether oxytocin has effect in man, because even man produces a lot of oxytocin, man produces a lot of prolactin, 
man produces the same hormones as the woman. The only problem is the distribution of receptors, the amount of receptors and receptor sensitivity. Oxytocin is also useful in man, especially in time of ejaculation. It is important in propulsion of sperms from epididymis, as deference, and out by the same contraction of my hey. cells around the vast difference. Otherwise, the physiological significance of oxytocin is not so much. But what we know is if there is excess oxytocin and if there's excess prolactin, man will also tend to show a lot more galactoria than it would be expected. That means you'll be producing milk and ejecting milk. Although in man, we shall find gynecomastia or enlargement of breasts and galactoria or production of milk is much more related to, to action of steroids and the failure of the liver to metabolize but even oxytocin and prolactin have some effect, have effect in man. And even find when there is hyperprolactinemia, too much prolactin production in man, it interferes with FSH. It interferes with follicle stimulating hormone that helps in, in uh, production of sperms. So it uh, interferes with the spermatogenesis. So whenever we have hyperprolactinemia in man, and this can also happen if there's increased oxytocin, but prolactinemia is commoner because we do get what are called prolactinomas or adenomas of the, <coughs> of the uh, galactrops in the anterior pituitary. We find those men tend to have problems with spermatogenesis when they have got high prolactin. However, here we are talking about oxytocin, but oxytocin <coughs> receptor activity has a lot to do with prolactin activity. They go up together and we shall even see in the slides, we shall see their curves. They increase quite uh, gently towards term, but at term, they are receptor sensitivity increases a hundred times. We can continue down that slide. Let's continue down the slide. Oh, before the thyroid, we wanted to finish on the oxytocin. So anyway, that is all we could talk about uh, the hormones of the posterior pituitary. That is vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin. As I told you, the important thing about these two nanopeptides is they are produced in the, in the hypothalamus, released in the posterior pituitary, and they come directly to organs, to tissues, not to other glands, and that is where they have their effect. In the mammary glands and in the uterus, and also in the male reproductive areas, in the male uh, <clears throat> sperm propulsion system or sperm transport system, both oxytocin and and this oxytocin is that they are also neurotransmitters. We find they are neurotransmitters in brain and in enteric brain in the GIT. And most times they are inhibitor. They are produced there at nerve endings as neurotransmitters in the brain and in enteric brain. That is in the mucosa of gastrointestinal system. So that is the important thing about the control of hypothalamus on lower glands and tissues. We saw there are four mechanisms. The most important is through anterior pituitary, through the release hormones and inhibitory hormones that release the three very, very important regulatory release hormones 
of the lower axis that we are now going to look at in the next classes, uh, the three axes of regulation of hormones will include the hypothalamic pituitary thyroxine or thyroid axis that regulates actions of thyroxine. Then we have the hypothalamic hypophysio. Hypophysio means pituitary. Uh, hypothalamic hypophysio adrenocortical axis that produces adrenocortex in the adrenal, uh, that produces corticosterone in the adrenocortex or rather cortisol and other steroids in the adrenocortex. And then the hypothalamic hypophysiogonadal axis that acts on gonads to produce sex steroids. That is estrogen, progesterone, and androgens. So these are the three main axes we shall be looking at. The growth hormone axis, we will look at it as just growth hormone action. We'll take some time, and I want you to go and read all about growth hormone. What are the actions of growth hormone? What is the importance of growth hormone? in our normal physiology. And when, where are the phases of growth hormone secretion? Because we know there's increased growth hormone in utero, in infancy, and during adolescence, during pubescence. Those are the three times you have growth hormone. So the rest of the time, what does growth hormone do? Then we have abnormalities of growth hormone. What does what happens if we have excess growth hormone secretion? What happens if we have inadequate growth hormone? What happens? And do we have synthetic growth hormone for it? And therefore, read about the physiology of somatomedins. Please Google. Don't just rely on classes. Classes just give you principles of physiology, but it is internet that gives you details of physiology. And these are the details that come in your exam, especially MC. Classes help you to explain. That is short answer questions and essays and to make decisions when you are practicing your medicine, pharmacy, or dentistry. But MCQs will be helped by internet, what you read in internet and in our textbooks. Textbooks even have the small subtopic written in bold. All these things written in bold are the ones that come in MCQs. See, like on this slide, you have got the word oxytocin, you have the word contractions myometrial control. You have the word milk ejection. That is what can come. And you have ejaculation. But that may not come because as you can see there, it has not really been uh, investigated enough. And when you think about oxytocin, relation of myometrial contraction and milk ejection that are most important. So, I'd like you to end there and you go back. At the end of the lecture, you look for some five, six minutes, you go back to that slide that shows you the four mechanisms through which hypothalamus regulates hormones below it, uh, regulates glands and tissues below it. And you have got four mechanisms. Major mechanism is through anterior pituitary, through hormone secretion. That is through stimulating hormone and inhibitory. Stimulatory hormones to the thyroid, stimulating hormones to adrenal cortex, stimulating hormones to the gonads. Those are the three major acts of anterior pituitary regulation by hypothalamus. And then you have inhibitory mechanisms, mainly to the growth hormone, that is to the liver, and inhibition 
to prolactin. Because you need prolactin there, it's just in case the day of milk will come. When there's no milk, you don't need prolactin. So that is why for prolactin, most of the regulation we have. Growth hormone inhibition again is most important for hypothalamus. So that is what I would like you to think about hypothalamus control of lower glands. Second mechanism is direct secretion and transmission, neurotransmission of these two neurotransmitters, tocin and vasopressin, into the posterior. And then these are onward secreted the uterus and the renal tubules. And then the third is through sympathetic. Hypothalamus behaves like the master ganglion of the sympathetic system, mainly for thermoregulation, osmoregulation barrel regulation and chemo regulation in the body through sympathetic system. And the fourth method is much, is, is much less than the others. And this is a direct communication with parts of the brain because hypothalamus is part of the brain. Hypothalamus is a part of the diencephalon. The frontal is between the frontal lobes and it communicates with the cortex in terms of being given some control which includes experience and reasoning. That is, it has somatic input. That is through the limbic system. Below, it also communicates with brainstem and mainly pawns. And this is even where temperature regulation, a lot of it is done through. So those are the four ways that hypothalamus regulates glands and tissue. We have not talk about uh, parasympathetic system when we are talking about regulation of hypothalamus. Because although hypothalamus does receive some input from parasympathetic, like through the glossophagia and vagus nerves, it doesn't do a lot of response through them. Unlike what it does with sympathetic system. So we would probably leave out parasympathetic. But now you have enough basis to be able to read everything about the hypothalamus and how it regulates those below it. You have enough introduction now to go and read specifics about the anterior pituitary hormones. That is the release hormones, the, the tropic, uh, the tropic hormones or stimulatory hormones from anterior pituitary, and you read about the two posterior pituitary hormones. And when you have understood all those, you can spend a little bit of luxury time looking at what is called the intermediate lobe of the pituitary. Because we've talked about anterior lobe, we've talked about posterior lobe, but we also have intermediate lobe of the pituitary that is very important in amphibia and fish and frogs in function. But in man, it is vestigial, it is remnant. And the main thing it produces is POMC, proopio melanocortin, a very large polypeptide of about 100 or about 247 amino acids length 
And this is usually broken down into pieces. These pieces make ACTH. So it actually produces ACTH, and ACTH is the main product of POMC. ACTH, then we have alpha melanocotin, alpha MSH. We have encephalins, the beta encephalins, and other hormones or factors that are used in the brain as neurotransmitters in the brain. And that is why it is pro-optio melanocotin because it has receptors on the um, opiate receptors in the brain. That means it has some effect on the brain receptors that interpret pain, the opiate receptors. And most important, we said POMC is inhibitory in the hunger center, the hunger cell. So that is intermediate lobe. When you think about, when you read about intermediate lobe, you mainly read about POMC and all the products it produces, all the small hormones that it produces. So I think we'll stop there. You now have all the basics about um, chemical mechanisms, that is endocrine mechanisms and systems. You already looked at classification of the different hormones. And now you go and look at regulation of hormone activity, hypothalamus anterior pituitary and posterior pituitary. So we can talk about the thyroxine axis next time on Wednesday. Thank you very much, and you have a nice afternoon.